Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jane Buckner, and I want to welcome you uh, to this uh, virtual update on what BRI is doing with respect to studying COVID-19. As donors, you are among our closest friends uh, here at Benaroy Research Institute, and I want you to know that your partnership in research is incredibly vital. Your support is what allows us to move forward in a variety of meaningful ways as we work towards our vision of a healthy immune system for everyone. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you for your commitment and generosity. And I want to make a very special shout out to the Ambassadors Council for hosting this research update. So what we're going to discuss today is our COVID-19 research. Uh, it's a wonderful example of how philanthropy is powering the research here at BRI. The work you'll hear about today was funded by donations from our Rapid Research Fund. Uh, we uh, raised over $350,000 from this fund, and it's been used to support the work that we have, um, have been working on for the last four months. An exciting thing and an, an announcement that we just made yesterday was because of this initial seed funding, we've already been able to garner $6 million or about $6 million in grants from the National Institute of Health to study COVID-19. And this has really been a powerful example of how philanthropy can kickstart our studies and help us move forward. I also want to say these are competitive grants from the NIH, so they recognize what um, talented scientists BRI has and our ability to do this kind of work. So today I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to share this work with you. And I'm going to give an overview today um, and then we'll be um, having two of our very talented investigators, Dr. Dan Campbell and Dr. Eric Wambre, talk about the work that they've been doing uh, related to COVID-19. So the agenda is, uh, I'll give you an overview of our rapid response. Dan is gonna talk about immune signatures of COVID-19 in patients who are recovering from critical illness. And then Eric's going to talk about visualizing immunity in COVID-19. So I think I'd like to start with what are some of the big questions that we have about this pandemic infection of really impacting everyone on planet Earth? Those include, first, can we find ways to treat and prevent COVID-19? Can we predict who's going to do poorly and who's gonna and when they will improve. And that's some of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and it gets to this question, why do some people have mild disease when they get infected with this virus and other severe disease? We wanna understand if COVID-19 has long-term effects on health and immunity, which are we're already starting to get a sense may occur. And then ask if people with immune diseases have increased risk for COVID-19, certainly a population that we care very much about here at BRI and have been uh, studying for years. And then once people have COVID-19, are they protected? Uh, and that question helps us then think about how do we make a good vaccine? And that's really ultimately the way we're hoping we can prevent this disease um, and get back to our normal lives. So why is BRI studying COVID-19? Well, our vision is for a healthy immune system for every individual. And I think that comes home today very much so. Our mission is to predict, prevent, reverse, and cure diseases of the immune system. And ultimately, our scientific approach is to make discoveries, to integrate those discoveries, translate them into human uh, disease and clinical outcomes, and then ultimately to intervene to improve people's lives. So at BRI, we um, are experts in immunology. We've been developing the tools to study immune diseases for the last 30 years, and the immune system is vital uh, in this disease. We're very agile. Um, we've got an infrastructure designed to study um, human diseases. We have the expertise in immunology. We have a very strong clinical connection, particularly with Virginia Mason, where we're able to make that link between the patient, the physician, and the scientists rapidly. And we're collaborative. And so our partnerships have meant a lot in this setting of this pandemic where all of us are trying to come up with answers. Our work with Virginia Mason Medical Center, our work with our colleagues and other institutions in Seattle, such as the University of Washington, 
our work with the National Institute of Health, who've reached out to us to help them with some of their large um, uh, projects. And then also collaborating with industry, such as the industries making vaccines, are all areas where our collaborative nature helps us uh, be part of the answers. So I always like to start by talking a little bit about the immune system. And, and so I'm going to talk about the immune system's job. And it's pretty simple. Its job is to detect and destroy dangerous things. And so if we think about how it does that work, first you need to turn the key and start the car. So it needs to detect that there's something dangerous going on. Then you have to put your foot on the gas and accelerate. And that's the job of the immune system to eradicate that dangerous thing. In this case, we're talking about the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Then it has to slow down and, and kind of recover. And part of the immune system's job, once it's destroyed that dangerous thing, is to kind of put on the brakes. But part of that is to repair the damage that's been there, as well as to stop the car. And then the immune system's job is to remember. Um, and that's what we call immunity. And the memory becomes really important as we think about infectious diseases um, and how we're going to deal with them in the future. I was thinking about, so when I drive a car, if I'm going to continue this analogy, I have to remember my key. I have to start it. I have to, you know, get it going with the gas. I need to slow down when I get somewhere. And then I have to remember where I parked it. And sometimes that's the hardest job for me. So last time uh, we did a research update, we had the good fortune of having uh, Adam Lacey Holbert talk to us um, about what he's doing related to COVID-19. And he's really interested in how our immune system starts and detects the virus. And in fact, some of his work is very much around how the virus gets into the cells of the body and once they're in the cells, are actually able to um, multiply, assemble, and leave and leave the cell. Um, and importantly, his research is helping us understand how we can stop the virus from getting into cells in a very early way. Can we find drugs that stop it actually binding to the cell, getting into the cell, and then replicating? We also talked, uh, Jessica Hammerman talked a little about this acceleration that the immune system does. So the immune system's job, once it detects danger, is to cause inflammation, and the inflammatory response helps us clear an infection. But we also know in COVID-19 patients that sometimes we hit the accelerator too fast, and individuals get something called cytokine storm. This is what actually leads to many of the patients who end up in our critical care units and on ventilators. They have an out of control immune response. Jessica actually has been studying cytokine storm and made major discoveries on its importance in the setting of systemic lupus and malaria. So she was perfectly positioned um, to start asking the same question in COVID-19 patients and, and she shared some of that work with you last time we did an update. So there's this other aspect of, as we think about this infection and the trajectory of the infection. And as we start, have been studying patients who come into the hospital um, and then recovered, we've started asking questions about what does that trajectory look like from a patient who comes in, is on the hospital floor, becomes critically ill, and then recovers. Um, and Dan's gonna talk to you a bit about that today. And then we're also very interested in understanding what happens once you recover from the disease and your immune memory. And Eric's going to talk a bit about that. So how do we do our work at BRI? Well, um, first, we start with questions. We come up with a plan, and that usually includes a lot of people to help us figure out what patients should we study, what tools should we use, um, how do we actually operationalize our work. Then we go to patients and get samples from them. We bring them to the laboratory where we're able to uh, generate data. And then we spend a lot of time thinking about that data and analyzing that data, work that's very actively going on right now at BRI. And then our goal is to have answers. Um, what we're doing here at BRI, what we started within weeks of the pandemic hitting Seattle, 
was that we started looking at patients and we have a group of patients who don't have COVID-19 who we can follow and understand their immune response. And we're doing that in several studies, including our Sound Life project at BRI. But we also started asking the patients with COVID-19, we started getting blood samples from them when they went to the hospital and uh, had patients who didn't feel well, but don't need to go to the hospital. We have the patients who need to be hospitalized but aren't critically ill, and then those who are in their intensive care units. We've been able to obtain samples from those patients over time. And our goal here is to understand why some people recover and what that looks like, why some people do poorly and even some die, and also what does it look like when they recover and are they immune? So as we think about how we do this work, um, the, we look at the blood of patients because it gives us a snapshot of the immune response to COVID-19. Just to say there's a lot of different cells in our blood of, and that are immune cells. In fact, there's over 600 billion immune cells in the human body. So there's a lot of cells out there. And I wanted to talk about the two aspects of the data you're going to be hearing about today. One is we're looking at all of these immune cells in the blood. It's kind of like looking at everybody in the stadium at a Seahawks game, trying to understand, is everyone cheering? Is everyone booing? Is one side doing the wave and the other side isn't? There's all sorts of information we can get in a big picture that gives us a sense for what's going on in the body. But we also want to focus on the important players in the game, and, and so I picked my favorite player, um, and look very much at the cells that we think are directing the action and that are responsible for clearing that infection and uh, creating immune memory. Um, and so we're going to be having Eric talk about his work, uh, and, and he's not tracking Russell Wilson, he is tracking T cells. Um, and so Dan's going to talk about tracking this immune trajectory where he's taken our samples and he's looking at all these different patients and what happens when they transition from, you know, being sick, but then becoming critically ill and then recovering again. And, and he'll tell you about that. And then Eric is going to talk about visualizing what the immune system looks like from the time you're uh, infected and ill with it, you recover. And then um, how long are you immune? And what does that immunity look like? Um, so COVID-19 is complex, and I'll tell you, immunology is complicated, but our goals are really simple. Um, they're to understand how the immune system fights COVID-19, so we can help people win that fight when they get infected. We are trying to understand why the immune system is detrimental to some people who have COVID-19, so that we can, we can block that harmful immune response. And then ultimately we wanna understand how the immune system can protect us from reinfection or infection. That will help us develop vaccines to prevent the disease. So with that, I'd like to hand this over to uh, Dan Campbell. He's the director of the Center for Fundamental Immunology here at Benaroya Research Institute. Dan? Thanks, Jane. It's my turn to share the screen, so I'll try to bring that up. How are we doing? I can see it. Successful? Excellent. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jane. Uh, my name is Daniel Campbell. I'm one of the director of the Center for Fundamental Immunology, and over the last uh, several months, like most of us uh, here at BRI, been involved in the um, COVID-19 response uh, here in the research that we've done and sort of transitioning how we've looked at immunological problems for many, many years and decades uh, and shifting that focus towards COVID-19. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is a, a fundamental question that I think we have and that I've wanted to think a lot about in the context of the data that we've been generating. We identify patients on the road to recovery. And so what I mean by this, that we have individuals coming into the hospital, coming into Virginia Mason Hospital and to hospitals all around the country who are sick, and a, a reasonably large fraction of those patients end up being severely ill and end up on mechanical ventilators. And so a patient who's on a mechanical ventilator 
our hopeful outcome for them is that they recover, that they are able to control the virus ultimately, that maybe with intervention and with, with proper supportive care, they can control the virus, recover, come off of that ventilator, on to recover and, and uh, you know, maintain and, and acquire immunity that Eric will talk about in the second part of this. Um, but some of these patients don't recover, right? They stay either on a ventilator for very long term or end up deceased. And we would like to be able to identify patients that are on the road to recover. And if we can do that, then we can allocate hospital resources and customize treatments for patients who are already, we know are already going to recover versus those that might need a little bit more help. We could, from a scientific standpoint and from an immunology standpoint, identify mechanisms by which the immune system protects us from disease. So what happens in a patient before they get better might tell us what kind of pathways we need to target and improve to get patients to go from a ventilator to, to a healthy state. And that, that's the third point here, that we want to identify new ways to treat disease and to promote recovery. So how are we going about doing that? Well, Jane already alluded to the fact that when patients come into the hospital across the street here at Virginia Mason, with, uh, with COVID-19 disease, you start as a healthy individual. You come in and you have disease and you, you're hospitalized. And throughout the course of hospitalization, we're repeatedly sampling these individuals with COVID-19. And this hospitalization course could run something like this, where you come in and you're hospitalized, but not in a critical care unit, end up uh, uh, developing more severe disease, end up on a ventilator for a while, end up in the critical care unit, start to recover, come out of that, and then are released from the hospital as a healthy, uh, you know, after uh, full recovery from the viral infection. And we're trying to acquire as many samples as we can across this entire range of hospitalization. And we have a scoring system that we've developed for how severe your disease is if you have COVID-19. And so what the work that I'm going to talk about, whoops, I didn't mean to advance my slide there yet. The work that I'm going to talk about, uh, what, what we've decided to do is really focus on these transition points then. We have a lot of samples across the range of the disease course for a lot of these subjects. What we really want to do is focus on the samples that, that we've acquired just before somebody declines, so before a significant clinical decline, or just before somebody recovers. So with these two transition points here, before you go on to a ventilator, after you go on to, or after you recover, taken off of that ventilator. And then we want to ask what changes in the immune profile of the individuals between here and here and back between here and here. And that's just depicted here as disease severity goes up. We want to look at this window here. And as patients recover, we want to look at this window here to see what are the signatures of, of, uh, of decline uh, and improvement. And so we do this, we take these blood samples and we measure hundreds of different things. So this is, I'm not gonna walk through this whole graph, don't worry, and there's not gonna be a uh, quiz on any of this at the end. But we measure hundreds of different parameters in these different blood samples. And then we ask a question then of what changed before and after recovery. So these are all different things that we've measured. And if it's a, a green dot, it shows what happened when a patient improved and if it's a red, uh, diamond, it shows what happened when a patient declined. And this is just a change. So right along this line here, that means it didn't change. If all the green and red dots are, are kind of clustered around that line, it means not much changed. That particular measurement when patients improved or declined. But you can see, hopefully, that we have big blocks of things that changed, right? So when patients improve, this block, these types of cells go up. When patients improved, and they went down, they tended to go down when patients declined. So we see the red and the green separating here. And we really had several blocks that are like this. And I'm gonna talk about three of them that I think we find particularly intriguing. So we measured different types of immune cells. We found three really interesting immune cell types that change as patients improve or as patients decline. And those are, I don't have them labeled on this slide, but they're, they have fancy names of T cells, eosinophils, and then the fanciest name of all, plasma cytoid dendritic cells. And I'll get through what all of those uh, do or what we think their role is in, in disease improvement here in a moment. So all of these cell types are down in individuals with severe disease and go down as, as disease severity, uh, as disease gets more severe, and then recover 
in the blood of patients as the, or go up in, in abundance in the blood of patients as they recover. So what do these things do? We'll talk about T cells first. If you've been to any of the BRI events before, I know you've heard about T cells. So, uh, so we'll talk about their role in disease here first. Um, as a little bit of review, this is how SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 disease infects us. It's a, it's a respiratory virus that is generally taken in through uh, aerosol particles into the lungs. Within the lungs, it finds the little airway spaces down here and then actually infects the epithelial cells that line the airways of the lungs, so that line the, the lung and exchange oxygen normally. The virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, infects these epithelial cells. This is the cause, the root cause of the problem that we have here with this virus. So here's a depiction then of the virus infecting some of these epithelial cells and T cells, which are one of these cells that uh, um, are associated with recovery from severe COVID-19 disease, they coordinate successful immune responses to SARS-CoV-2, and they do that in two different ways, two different broad classes of T cells. And Eric's gonna talk a lot more about this, so I'm just gonna go over it really quickly. Some T cells actually find and kill these infected cells. So if a cell is infected with COVID with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, one class of T cells will actually seek these cells out and just kill that cell and in the process kill the virus that's infecting that cell and not allow it to. So some T cells find and kill infected cells. Other classes of T cells actually help make the antibodies that we hear so much about in the news. So this class of T cells interacts with another type of cell called a B cell, and that helps the B cell make the antibodies that then can coat the virus and block infection. So T cells then can get rid of actively infected cells and can prevent new infection of cells by producing the antibodies, by helping produce the antibodies that will bind and neutralize the virus. Both of these types of T cells are impacted in the severely ill COVID-19 patient. Both recover uh, as those patients are recovering. So we think this is a real uh, clue as to the importance of T cells in combating the virus and, and promoting recovery from infection. The two other cell types that we, I don't think many of us here at BRI were surprised by the, the role of T cells in the uh, response to COVID-19. But these other two cell types are really interesting and actually were quite a surprise, I feel like. So these are two other cell types that we found in our data that were really strongly associated with recovery from ours cov 2 uh, viral infection. And I mentioned they have sort of fancy names, and I'm just gonna talk quickly about what they do in viral, how they help protect us. The first are these plasmacytoid dendritic cells. These are some of the rarest immune cells actually that we have in the blood. So uh, being able to even study and measure them is a bit of a technical feat. But these cells are really sentinels that scream out virus, virus, virus. So I think of these as like Paul Revere on his midnight ride who screamed out the red coats are coming over and over again. Um, the plasmacytoid dendritic cells are like that with a virus. They scream out virus, 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 and they alert other cells in the body and help them, tell them to turn on their defenses, and make them much more resistant to viral infection. So they're really important cells in coordinating antiviral immunity. Well, and then really intriguing to me, especially, and this, this gets back to something Jane touched on in, in her introduction, class of cells called eosinophils. Eosinophils are a very well studied immune cell population in the context of allergic responses. So they play a real prominent role in individuals with allergy and individuals with asthma. Um, but over the last several years, it's been uh, better appreciated that in addition to this role in allergic responses, these eosinophils also can promote tissue repair. So here, I think this is likely the key factor, or the key role that they're playing in the context of COVID-19 disease. You not only have the virus causing damage in the lungs, but I mentioned that those T cells will actually kill infected cells, right? This leaves both of those things, leave a lot of tissue damage that needs to be cleaned up and repaired. And I think this sort of wave of eosinophils that we see in a lot of the severe COVID-19 patients that are now on the road to recovery really reflects the fact that their immune system is turning on this tissue repair response and is uh, hopefully indicative of the fact that patients on the road to recovery. 
So we have this uh, progression then of immune cell types where we have to alert, we have to control the virus with T cells that kill cells and, and make antibodies. We have to alert other cells that there's a virus around so they can turn on their own defenses and be more resistant to infection. And then we have to repair all the damage. And I think those are sort of the three key parts to the immune response to, to SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 that helps uh, delineate sort of or identify a successful response to virus. And so I think these data or these results raise a lot of key questions that we want to follow up on. Now. These are just the early days of these uh, studies. And so first is how can we use this information, right? Can we use this information to identify patients who are recovering and individualize therapies for stages of disease? So if you see this wave, for example, of eosinophils coming back, is this a sign that that patient's on the road to recovery? And we may not have to be as aggressive in the intervention as anybody else who uh, is not showing those signs of recovery. Number two, why are the responses misfiring and causing severe disease in the first place? A lot of people who get infected do not end up on a ventilator, right? So what's going wrong? Why are they mounting, why are these individuals mounting inappropriate responses to start with? And we know that age is a key risk factor. And with some of these cell populations, especially with T cells, we know that their function declines with age. So that give, might give us a clue on some of that. Um, where are the cells going in severely ill patients? This is something I really want to know. We don't find them in the blood, severely ill patients. Why is that? Are the cells dying? Are they going somewhere we don't know? We've not been able to look in other tissues, so we don't know what's happening to these cells, but I think it's really important to understand what's happening to the cells in order to answer the second question here. And then finally, how do we promote healthy responses? What can we do to help uh, initiate or, or boost these responses that are gonna control the virus? And equally importantly, I think, in the context of these severe patients, repair the damage, right? And so with that, um, I'm gonna wrap up my portion of the, of the afternoon and hand this now over to Eric, who's gonna talk a lot more about T-cell response to the virus. Thanks, Dan. So I'm going to share my screen now. Sharing. Okay. Um, so, uh, so my name is Eric Rambray. I'm uh, one of the principal investigator here at uh, BRI, and uh, today I'm going to talk about. Uh, how we visualized the T cell immunity uh, in COVID-19 patients. And uh, I will also try to explain why measuring T cell immunity is uh, one of the key things uh, for developing a future vaccine uh, that will fight uh, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, uh, what, what we can learn from T cells immunity, and also how we measure the T cells here at BRI. So uh, as previously uh, described by um, Jane and Dan, the development of immunity to viral infection is a multi-state process that typically take place over one to two weeks and involve a lot of human cells. Um, the body responds to a viral infection immediately with a non-specific innate response in which the pro-inflammatory cells slow the process of the virus and may even prevent it from causing the symptoms. So this non-specific response is followed by another immune response called the adaptive response, where the body makes uh, an immune wires known as T cells that help us fight the virus in a more specific manner. And one of the key messages is to say that the development of these virus-specific T cells represents a key event into the fight against the virus. So um, how the T cells uh, fight this viral infection? So they are doing that through the production of virus cytokine to induce the production of antibodies that will specifically bind to the virus to neutralize its activity. The, the T cells can also uh, spur other immune cells into action to prevent the progression to severe illness 
and to clear the virus from the body. And for individuals that successfully control infection, this virus elicited T cells can provide a lifelong surveillance and protection from future insults. But their importance for battling the SARS-CoV-2, uh, the virus that caused COVID-19, currently remain unclear. So why measuring T cells immunity to SARS-CoV-2? So um, the ability to measure and understand the T cell immunity to SARS-CoV-2 infection is a major knowledge gap currently impeding the COVID-19 vaccine development, interpretation of COVID-19 disease pathogenesis, and the calibration of the future social distancing pandemic control measure. Um, measuring T cell response to coronavirus infection can tell us whether infected people harbor T cells that target the virus and whether this response correlates with neutralizing antibody response. Uh, this is important because um, researchers have put a lot of emphasis on antibodies but it's still not clear uh, whether antibodies or T cells are more important for protection from the virus. Learning more about the strengths and the quality of a person immune response to SARS-CoV-2 could help the scientists to better understand immunity to the virus and the reason why responses vary, vary between uh, individuals. How soon T cells can be detected after infection we mean also something that we will need to determine. Um, the other, um, it is also frequently assumed that developing T cells memory against SARS-CoV-2 will be beneficial. However, this is also great uncertainty about whether it is the case or whether a pathogenic response can occur depending on the timing, the composition, or the magnitude of this uh, T cells immune response. While there is no direct evidence to support these outcomes, this must be considered also. It remains also to determine whether people who haven't been infected uh, by the virus also have these T cells that can fight this virus. We need to determine whether past exposure to other coronaviruses, which are the cousins of the SARS-CoV-2, such as those that can cause common cold, may have somehow created some small residual T cell immunity able to recognize and attack the new virus. Pre-existing T cell immunity, SARS-CoV-2, could be relevant because it could influence COVID-19 disease severity. For instance, uh, it could give the immune system a head start by allowing uh, it to leverage pre-existing reactive reactivity to mount a faster or better response. It might also be a disadvantage in that pre-existing immunity could lead to the immune system to take SARS-CoV-2 less seriously. The pre-existing CD4 T cells memory could also influence the vaccination outcome, leading to a faster or better immune response, particularly the development of neutralizing antibodies, which generally depend on T cells. Estimation of the T cells immunity to SARS-CoV-2 are also uh, central to epidemiological model calibration of future social distancing pandemic control measure. Such protection are dramatically different depending on whether the, the, this uh, new virus infection or the future vaccination will create substantial immunity and whether any cross-reactivity immunity exists between SARS-CoV-2 and the circulating seasonal common cold uh, human um, coronavirus. If we detect SARS-CoV-2 reactive T cells in an individual, this may be indicative of prior exposure to the virus. However, it is currently unknown whether such a T cell responses in infected people will provide a lifelong surveillance and protection from future insults. And if so, how strong response is needed for this to occur? The other things that remain to determine is, uh, as you probably know, to spark the production of antibodies that will neutralize the virus, vaccine need to stimulate helper T cells. If we can, if we vaccinate people, we need to make sure it will develop T cells immunity to SARS-CoV-2 
we also need to know what immunity we want to induce and what immunity we want to stay away from. We will have also to determine whether this vaccine elicited T cells can provide a lifelong surveillance and protection from future exposure. Um, like other coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 particles are large viruses, and they are composed of four major proteins uh, called the spike protein, the nucleocapsid protein, the membrane protein, or you have also the enveloped protein. Measuring T cells immune response to SARS-CoV-2 can also tell us which viral protein pieces would provoke the most powerful T cell response. So such a knowledge can guide selection of vaccine strategy most likely to elicit protective immunity against SARS-CoV-2. Um, SARS-CoV-2 has been identified as the causative agent of COVID-19. In some patients, as you know, the infection results in moderate to severe acute respiratory distress symptoms, syndromes, requiring uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. One of the biggest questions unanswered uh, is why some patients develop severe disease and why others do not. Um, the other question we would like to address is why children are less susceptible to COVID-19 clinical symptoms, whereas it seems that older people are much more susceptible to fatal COVID-19. Uh, the disease curse and severity can depend on the magnitude and the composition of human T-cell response to SARS-CoV-2. So again, measuring T-cell response to SARS-CoV-2 is of immediate relevance, as it will provide insight into the immunity and pathogenesis of uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and the same knowledge can help us delivering the right care to the right patient at the right time. So, um, because SARS-CoV-2 is a new virus that has never been studied before, all these fundamental knowledge are currently missing for COVID-19. So how you, we visualize SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells here at BRI. The definition and assessment of human um, virus specific T cell responses are best made with a direct visualization of these cells in patient's blood. At BRI, we pioneered the development of immunological tools to directly investigate T-cell immunity. The first tools we developed relied on the direct visualization of SARS-CoV-2 specific T-cells. So what we are doing is we are attaching some fragment of the virus to a molecular complex called MHC tetramer. And this complex is labeled with a fluorochrome that behave like a light bulb, allowing us to visualize the cells that will bind to this complex. And what we are doing is we are using a machine called the flow cytometer to detect which cells um, are, um, uh, are tagged with this signal. And um, right now I'm showing you really new data that we generated uh, last week using this technology. So as you can see here, um, you can see, uh, so this is called uh, dot plot. So each uh, little dots um, here are one cells. And you can see that if they are going up, it means that we detect the signal of our molecular complex loaded with some viral fragment. And if they are going to the right, it means that um, these cells are clearly T cells. And you can see here in this example, uh, using uh, COVID-19 blood samples, we were able to detect a lot of COVID uh, or SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells in the COVID-19 positive subject. However, when you looked in the, uh, the right uh, dot plots, you can see that we don't see any of these dots uh, going up in these signals in a non-infected subject. Another approach we are using to track SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells is by uh, trying to uh, activating in vitro these cells using um, uh, a stimulation with the fragment of the virus. And what we are doing here is if you have the cells that can recognize these fragments, uh, they will um, express a signal uh, saying, hey, I know, I, I recognize this fragment. And these signals here at BRI, we can detect it. Again, we are using some fluorochrome to tag this signal, 
and this, with using the same machine, we can detect the cells that will have the 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 the, the, the fluorochrome tag on it. And now I'm sharing you uh, again new results uh, generated last week. Uh, so in this technology, we you have three stimulation. The first one we use uh, a product uh, that should be a negative control. Um, and you can see that we don't have any signal in the in the red square. Uh, so clearly, um, this is a clean signal. Then we try to use as a positive control. Uh, uh, we stimulate the cells with a common cold virus. And uh, most of us uh, normally should be ex uh, have been exposed to this virus. And you can see in this patient that we clearly detect a, a signal. And then the question is, can we detect also a signal by stimulating the cells with the SARS-CoV-2 protein? And you can see here, this is a COVID-19 positive patient. We clearly were able to detect T cells reactivity uh, against uh, those uh, protein. And where we are doing the same type of experiment in a COVID-19 uh, 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 negative patient, um, what we observe is, again, our negative control using uh, DMSO was clearly clean. And this patient was previously exposed by, uh, probably exposed or, or received um, a, a vaccine against uh, common cold virus. However, because this patient was never exposed to uh, COVID-19, we did not detect any T-cells.